This happened a few days ago, and I'm still pretty shaken up about it. I only just thought to post it, so here goes. On Friday afternoon, I got a call from my friend named Sarah, asking if I wanted to meet her and another friend named Lisa at Dunkin' Donuts, as we hadn't seen one another in quite a while. Dunkin' Donuts is a 15-minute walk from my house, so I decided I would walk. Besides, the weather was fine. I got to Dunkin' Donuts and found where Sarah and Lisa were sat and went to join them. As we were chatting, I noticed that my sister Elena was sat at a table in the corner of the room with her friend Jess. For some context, my sister and her friend are both 18. My sister still lives with my parents, whereas I live alone. I excused myself from the table for a moment and went over to Elena and Jess's. They were sat at a table with three seats, so I sat down with them and said hi. They both jumped a little bit like they were really startled, but then looked more relieved than anything to see me. Immediately, Elena leaned in and whispered to me, Don't look now, but that guy in the blue shirt? I think he's been following Jess and I. I glanced over and saw a middle-aged man sat at a table, facing slightly away from us. He's walked past our table a good five times in the past 20 minutes to go to the bathroom, but he always walks slower when he passes by us, she continued. I told them they were most likely being paranoid, and there was nothing to worry about, but for their peace of mind, I offered to leave with them so they wouldn't feel as worried. I walked back over to my table and explained the situation to Sarah and Lisa. Both of them laughed it off and assumed my sister was just being paranoid. Literally, about a minute later though, I saw that same man get up from his seat and walk toward the bathroom. My eyes followed him, and sure enough, he walked extremely slowly past Elena and Jess. In fact, it was almost comical how obvious he became. Both of them looked in my direction, and I nodded to show them that now that I had seen him, I believed them. About five minutes later, I went to the toilets myself. On my way, I passed Elena and Jess and told them I was ready to go whenever they were. They both agreed that they wanted to leave right now. I told them I was going to go to the bathroom for a moment, and we could leave after I had done my business. Elena had come in her car, so she was going to give me a lift back. I went into the toilet stall, did my business, washed my hands. I was walking down the corridor back to the main eating area, when Elena and Jess rushed into the corridor, I asked them what was wrong. They explained that another man had joined that strange creeper, and the men were both pointing and staring at them, so they rightfully felt unsafe. We walked back into the eating area. I put my money on our table and explained to Lisa and Sarah that I was taking off, and I would explain what was going on fully when we got home. We all got into Elena's car and left those creeps in the car's rearview mirror, after a two-minute drive, we reached my house. Just then, I remembered that I had been meaning to return something I had borrowed from my mother, so I asked if Elena could drive me to my parents' house, as she was going there anyway. I jumped out of the car to get what I needed, when suddenly my phone rang. It was Elena. She explained that a car had just driven past and pulled into a driveway. She said the driver of the vehicle was that same creep from Dunkin' Donuts, I took a peek out my window, and sure enough, there was a car which didn't belong to the owner of the house, parked right on their driveway. I ushered the girls into my home and locked the door. I instructed Elena to take a photo of the car and its license plate, while telling Jess to call 911. She gave the operator more information than I could. Elena took the photos and we sort of gathered around Jess as she was speaking to the operator. She had finished telling the story and I heard the operator assure us the police would be at my house soon. Just a few minutes later, there was a loud knock at the front door, followed by a loud voice shouting, It's the police! We all breathed a sigh of relief as I went to open the door. Jess told the operator the police were there and went to hang up. I was just in the process of unlocking the door when I thought to look through the peephole at the top. I peered through, but what I saw was not a police officer. It was the same man. I froze in fear and didn't know what to say. We, we didn't call the police. I managed to shout back at the man through the door. 
Elena and Jess were both very confused as to why I was doing this. Uh, we had a call, sir? The man shouted back. You must have the wrong address. I informed the girls it was the creep at the door and not an officer. Both were rightfully shocked and extremely scared, as was I. I was about to tell Jess to call the police again, until I heard the sirens. The man began to panic. Sir, you have to let me in right now! This time I didn't answer. He was pounding on the door. His commands for me to let him in turned into pleading and begging. I heard the police car pull up and some commotion outside. An actual officer then knocked on the door, and I let him in. And yes, I did check the peephole first. The police officers took the man into custody, while another police officer took Elena and Jess into the dining room for some brief questioning. I called my parents, and Jess called hers. Both were here extremely quickly once we told them what had happened. The man was found with a kitchen knife on his person, and some other weapons in the car. Who knows what could have happened if I hadn't had the instinct to look through the peephole first. Both my sister and her friend are fine, although they are shaken up after the whole incident. So I, 20 and female, lived in a shady-as-hell apartment complex in an otherwise rich suburban area for three years, and I have a hell of a lot of stories that could fit here. But this one is about a neighbor I'll call Bob. A little bit of backstory. Me, 18 at the time, and my then 16-year-old sister used to babysit all of the neighborhood kids. These kids considered us their friends. It even got to the point where they seemed to have a radar of whenever me and my sister went outside. They'd come out and talk to us, and we'd let them ride our skateboards and such in the parking lot. The kids were all ages 8 through 13. So one day, we were outside with them, when we were suddenly joined by a stranger. He stood between us and our car, towering over us. He introduced himself and asked us to sign this petition he made up. We did, just being friendly. Then he asked us how old we were. I thought maybe he was a fellow teenager that perhaps looked just a bit older, or maybe he was just an awkward adult, so I told him I was 18. Of course, the very next question was if I wanted to go out with him, right in front of my mom and the other kids' moms as well. I awkwardly declined, but he continued talking about how he thought me and my sister were in middle school. Apparently, he was also 28. Eventually, he just kind of wandered away and asked someone else to sign his petition. A few days later, he knocked at our door after asking the neighbor for the address. He had a bag of what he said was chicken and wanted us to go eat it with him at the park. We declined and said we had schoolwork to do. He walked away, mumbling and grumbling about how antisocial everyone was. Later, we looked out our window and saw him playing baseball with two small girls. He kept physically moving their arms to different positions, even though they were clearly shrugging away from him. The next day, one of the little kids runs right up to me. I'll call her Maddie. She was eight. She had just gotten a new pair of Heelys and wanted to show off and have me help her with them. I was holding her hand and guiding her along, when Bob appeared and said he could help better. Maddie said no, but he insisted. He actually pushed me out of the way and reached for Maddie, holding her tightly around the upper chest area. Her grandma was there too, and flipped out. He just sort of meandered away. The next day, Maddie was freaking out, saying Bob had been sitting on her porch when she left for school that morning. Her parents found out, and as they walked outside, he let himself in. He went into their kitchen and started making orange chicken. We later found out another neighbor had a similar story as well. Another time, we were helping a family move. They had a two-year-old son. The garages are in a triangle shape to the road, almost like a roundabout. There's a flat patch of grass behind them. Well, here comes Bob to help us. He criticized the way we packed things and didn't help until our neighbor politely asked him to leave. Well, he left the garage, but instead of actually leaving... He asked the two-year-old if he wanted to go off and play. When the kid said no, it made him angry. He picked up the kid to play, and the kid slapped him. 
He asked if the kid wanted to go behind the garages now. The kid's mom hadn't noticed yet, so I went with them and guided the kid back to his mom. The climax of this story is when my sister and I went on a walk with our 17-year-old friend and her other friend. Maddie ran up to us and wanted to come along. So here we are, starting our walk, when Bob comes out. He sees our friend and immediately asks how old she is and how much she weighs because she's so skinny. He asks where we're going, too. My friend tells him we're going for ice cream on a girl's trip. He got real mad and stomped away. We continued our walk, but halfway through, I got this weird feeling. So I looked behind us. Bob is sprinting towards us. He yells at us for hiding from him while also telling Maddie how pretty she is. An older neighbor saw this and immediately asked what was going on. He told the man we were being mean, and he needed to go write a song about us or something. He left, but later we saw him sitting at the park. When he saw us, he instantly came running again. We stop, and he asks us which one of us is over 18. Maddie's dad was there at this point, and told him we weren't interested in him. He exploded, telling the dad to fuck himself and various other rude things and expletives, also calling me a bitch. Maddie was crying, and the neighbor who saw us before rushed over to check on us since he'd seen Bob running. Bob went inside muttering to himself. For a few weeks, we didn't see him. A single dad and his five-year-old daughter moved in, and we were introducing ourselves to them. My mom kind of tipped him off that there was someone in our building who was a little bit off, especially around Maddie. The dad said he'd seen someone like that giving candy to kids at the pool while they seemed uncomfortable. Here comes Bob as if on cue. He immediately tells the girl in front of her dad that she looks like a movie star and how pretty she is. He asked to take her off and play with her, but the dad says no of course and they go inside. Turns out they were next door neighbors. We still didn't see him much, but the other neighbors were telling us all kinds of horrible stories about him. There was a woman who was alone most of the day with her two kids under five, who told us he stared and watched her whenever she went to and from her car. Maddie's parents continued to see him watching her, too. Then one day, again, we're babysitting, and here he comes, only this time he's swinging some nunchucks. Maddie screamed and hid in our car. He strolls over, nunchucks in hand, and starts talking to us all casual. But then he starts looking around. Where's Maddie? We told him she wasn't here, and he seemed to walk away. By then, most of the kids were afraid to go outside whenever they saw him. He had a habit of wandering around the complex. We could tell by his height and lanky gait. A few times, we'd see Bob with his dad. Those times, neither even glanced at us. Then one day, he just stopped showing up. We'd still see his dad and brother come in and out all the time, but we'd never see him. We only saw him again a year later, and it was only for one day near Christmas. Then he disappeared altogether. I really don't know what happened to him, but it was just one of those weird experiences with neighbors in the three years we lived there. Maybe I'll post the stories of a chick that wanted to kill her parents because she was a witch, or the old man that bit children next, if you want to hear them. Before we start, remember kids, stranger danger. If you don't know them, don't give them the time of day. This was about 15 years ago or so. My parents had gone out for a nice dinner for their anniversary and decided that I was old enough and responsible enough to be left alone, at least just for a few hours on a weeknight. I was almost nine at the time and we owned a fairly protective dog as well. So, what could possibly go wrong? They leave and tell me to lock up and call if anything happens. I do so and immediately proceed to party around the house like a rock star. Because, dude, I had the whole dang house to myself and I could do whatever I wanted. Hell to the yeah. About halfway through a Sailor Moon marathon, I suddenly get a knock at the door. I was confused as all get out because it had only been about two hours and they had said they wouldn't be back until around 10 anyway. I guessed Mama had left something she needed behind again and swung around to grab it. My front door is a system of two doors, a super old, thick wooden one, from the house being originally built in the 30s. 
and then outside of that a screen door. My dog was raising absolute hell at the front door. I pulled her back a bit to try and calm her down because she had a tendency to be very reactive to almost any noise. Well, it was not my mom at the door. It was some middle-aged man I'd never seen before in my life. Papa O was now basically feral, so I kept the screen door firmly closed and a hand on her collar. I asked the man what he wanted. He started on in this weird convoluted story about how he had two young twin daughters and they'd gotten into a fight and one of them had run away. This man claimed that he believed his daughter was now hiding in my house and would like to come inside to look for her. I tell him immediately there is no such girl here. Why would he even think she would be here in the first place? He starts going in on this story about how this was the house they first lived in and how it's the one she was born in. It was like a safe place for her or something and would likely be the most likely place she would run away to as it was really the only other place she knows. I had felt kind of weird at first when I opened the door slightly and heard this dude's story and this stuff was absolutely not helping his cause. But now I definitely knew something shitty was about to go down. I, in no uncertain terms, informed the guy he must have the wrong house because this house was built and has been lived in by my family since its very initial construction. My dad was born in this house, and after my mom and dad told his parents that they were pregnant with my older sister, they gave it to them as a present to begin their new family. He must be mistaken, because I knew all of this to be fact. Hell, there were pictures less than 10 feet away from me on the wall of my dad and uncle playing in the front yard in the late 70s, by now, my dog was growling like crazy, and the dude was getting extremely agitated. He insists that I have no idea what I'm talking about. If I would just give him a few minutes to search for his daughter, he could be on his way right away. The latch on the screen door was broken at the time, and I was putting all my strength into holding my dog from the door. He opened the screen door with one hand, and the other reached for my closest arm. All of a sudden, that crazy cocker goes fucking ballistic. She used all her strength to lunge at him, grabbed a hold of his hand, and bit down fiercely. Now the man was yelling and confused. He pushed back against the screen door and slammed it shut to get my dog off of him. Sadie got pushed back inside, but she was still raging away. I quickly slammed the front door and locked it, and chained it tight. I ran around the house and made sure all the other doors and windows were locked and then hunkered down in the bathroom, hyperventilating. I waited about 15 minutes until Sadie's growling had calmed some. I check outside, no man or his car. Both were now long gone. I call my parents and tell them they need to come home right now please. When they get home, I recount the whole story. My dad goes to check the front door. And sure enough, on the screen door jam and siding of the house was a large handprint of blood. Sadie was treated like a queen and got a whole steak for her to eat that weekend. When I was 15, I was in a really bad mental headspace. With that being said, I was depressed lonely, and desperate for anyone's attention. So, against my better judgment, I made an account on plenty of fish. I understand that I put myself in a dangerous position for predators, but I also understand that any man who I told my age to should have just reported my account and not spoken to me. But, after swiping left and right for about an hour, I met a man who I'll call Red. Red was 26, a father of two beautiful toddlers and a Puerto Rican native who had recently moved to Florida. He spoke a fair bit of English and had this charm to him whenever he spoke. When I told him my age, it's scary now to think about just how okay he was with it. He simply told me that we wouldn't have sexual relations and our other interactions would be innocent. We talked for a few months before talking eventually about meeting up. When I talked to Red, I felt very happy, whole, like I finally had someone to support me. The first few times we met up, it was fine. 
We went to the outlets, Disney Springs, the movies. He was a perfect gentleman. Held my hand, opened doors for me, and most importantly, kept his hands off me. Eventually, we did kiss a bit, but nothing too intense. About six months into our relationship, though, I turned 16, and I invited him to my house, through means of sneaking in through my window, of course, and he agreed. We were just hanging out watching a movie, when he kissed me in a way he never had before, in a way I'd never been kissed before. It was surprising, and without having to be said, very overwhelming. I suddenly got very scared. It finally hit me in that moment that this guy was a full-grown man and I was just a child. I got off my bed and told him he had to leave. His face immediately contorted into anger, and he stepped toward me, trying to convince me through gritted teeth not to force him to go. He reached out to grab my shoulders, and out of instinct I shoved his chest to make him back off, only for a very harsh shove to be returned. A sudden hot pain overwhelmed me, spreading from the back of my head and down the rest of my body. Then everything went black. The next thing I knew, I was hearing a blood-curdling scream. Hazed out and too weak to open my eyes fully, I could just barely make out my mom. I felt this wetness on my head, and my body felt so cold. It was just as I began to gather that something was very wrong, that I lost consciousness once again. The following time that I awoke was in a hospital bed. My head was pounding like crazy and aching in the back. I reached up to hazily feel where the pain was coming from, and my fingertips grazed a row of staples on a now bald patch on the left back of my head, making me wince. Things went by very fast from that point on. A doctor and my mother and father explained that I must have slipped and hit my head on the windowsill, being that that's where the first impact was made, before falling the rest of the way onto my tile floor. My mom had come into my room in the morning to wake me up for school and found me lying in a pool of my own blood. She thought I was dead because my breathing was so faint. But they had no idea as to why I had really slipped. I was too embarrassed and ashamed of myself to tell anyone. I didn't think I deserved justice for what Red did to me. Later on, I found out further obstacles would come from my injury, hearing loss in my right ear, as well as the inability to retain some old memories. This event and a few flash memories from my childhood are the last things that I remember from before the incident. Though I was saddened by this, I was happy to still be alive and never have to see Red again. Now being 18, a few months ago I signed up for Plenty of Fish again. I kept my wariness about me this time though, and didn't go on any dates. I looked out for warning signs this time and upon the first one blocked just about everyone that messaged me. Then one day I received a new message. It was from Red. I had blocked him on every other platform including his number. It just said, Hey, how have you been? I didn't respond, but I looked at his profile. It still said he was 26. How odd. Perhaps I never really knew his real age. Perhaps I didn't know this man at all, being that he thought he had killed me and selfishly ran off without even attempting to see if I was alive or even if he could help me. Update. I've seen all the comments of people suggesting and demanding that I go to the police. I've already taken action on this a few months ago. I didn't include it in the original story because I didn't want to feel like a fool. I went to the police by myself after seeing him on Plenty of Fish again, and they had no records for anyone with his name or age. I gave a description, but it was just like the description of any generic Hispanic male, and they couldn't really take action on it. I had no pictures with him, and his Plenty of Fish pictures all had his face covered somehow. The first time I ever really saw his face was when we started Snapchatting. He used to have an Instagram, but I guess now it's been deleted. I even tried to tell them the names of his two toddlers, but they couldn't find anything with that either. Why I Love Cats, or at least one of the many reasons I love cats. 
I work about a mile from my house in a pretty small town. 100,000-ish, very spread out though. I grew up in one of the largest cities in the States, so living here has been kind of a bit of culture shock. It's very easily accessible by walking, so I pretty much never drive. About a half year ago, I had just finished work at around 1am. Nobody has ever really out past 8 or so here. Also a huge shock coming from that big city. So the park I walked through was utterly deserted. Mind you, I live in one of the safest countries in the world. Not America anymore. So it's easy to forget just how vulnerable you can still be as a small female. I honestly didn't feel uncomfortable at any point of my walk until I rounded the corner past some basketball courts nearby my house. I was still about two minutes away from home and this stretch of my walk was pitch dark. The moon was massive that night. While I had welcomed its light at the beginning of my journey and the absence of any streetlights, it actually made things look pretty eerie. I had walked this path before hundreds of times, but tonight for some reason, something felt off. I'm not a fearful person in any sense of the word, but I was suddenly really on edge. And then I saw it, a van in the parking lot next to the courts, with its side door wide open. I picked up my pace a little and kept an eye on that van. There are usually cars in that parking lot. I live in a tourist town and backpackers often stay in their vehicles to save money. But I had never seen one with its door hanging open like that in the middle of the night. Not ever. I was so focused on that van that I missed a man walking out from the trees near the courts until he was a mere 30 feet behind me. He was walking incredibly fast and there was very little doubt that he was heading straight towards me. I was at a complete loss for what my next action should be. Not like screaming would do much. I was still too far away from any residences. I usually carry a glass water bottle with me for protection. We have very strict laws on weapons here. But it turns out I had forgotten it at work that night. My phone was completely dead. Everything I knew better than to do I had done that night. And as stupid as I feel writing this... I hesitated to run away, on the off chance that maybe he didn't mean to act so sketchy. I've moved past this mindset overall since, but there's still a strong part of me that balks at the prospect of making someone feel uncomfortable or embarrassed. I also hate showing men that I feel scared of them, because even if they hurt me, I'd rather not give them any satisfaction of seeing my fear. Also, I kind of knew in my heart that I probably couldn't outrun this guy with the speed he was walking. I was overthinking every little thing. I saw a little dark blur darting across the library parking lot at the back of the courts. I didn't even register what it was at first. The whole situation was so surreal. The guy was behind me now, and judging by his footsteps, he had not veered course at all. I quickened my pace a little felt out my keys in my purse, and slipped them in between my fingers. I heard a slight jingling noise, and then everything suddenly made sense. That blur I'd seen was Apollo, a large black cat that often walked with me on the home stretch after the park. Tonight, he was doing that weird cat run, where they got real low to the ground with their ears hung back. I had an impression he was very angry, but he was moving too fast for me to see his face properly as he rushed right past me. I kept on walking at my fast speed, but suddenly I could hear the heavy footsteps were now retreating. I didn't dare to look back and kept moving forward as quickly as possible. Apollo suddenly appeared by my side, still staying low to the ground and stopping every few feet to look behind him and hiss. Then he would do his weird cat run to catch back up with me. He walked the entire way home with me as he had done many times but I had never seen him act like that. As we neared my gate, he visibly relaxed and flopped onto his back. I coaxed him inside before giving him some big hugs and head bumps. After that, I stopped walking home by myself at night and still saw my sweet little cat friend very often. I never saw him behave that way again, though. Apollo, unfortunately, moved away three months ago. I still miss my little buddy and often think about how strange that night was. 
I wish I'd turned around to see what he did to chase the guy off. I've heard many stories about dogs protecting people, but rarely ever any about cats. My own little girl would never do anything like what Apollo did. So, to the parking lot creeper, let's not meet. And to Apollo, I hope to meet you again one day. From 2006 to 2011, I worked in the electronics department at the local Walmart in the small city I lived in. Throughout those five years I had worked there, I had plenty of creepy encounters with strange customers, especially considering the state hospital was just across the road. This story isn't just a regular old creepy encounter though, but something that would lead to me being stalked for nearly an entire year. It all started in 2010, on a night I was working second shift. I was doing my end shift ritual when a woman in her late 40s interrupted me. She was there with a little girl, must have been no older than three or four. Excuse me, I need help with my cell phone? She spoke very softly and proceeded to tell me her problem. I need to turn my phone into a straight talk phone. The girl earlier said you could do it. Oh, fucking of course she did. I thought that to myself at least, but my lips instead said, Sure, let's see what I can do. She handed me a six-year-old phone from Verizon, and I knew as soon as I saw it that I would not be able to do what she wanted. I explained she would have to buy a new phone from Straight Talk and transfer her old number. Pretty basic shit, really. Now, I always took my job very seriously and held myself to the highest possible standard of customer service. I would often receive letters to the store from customers complimenting me, so I assure you I did nothing to actually piss off this lady, but sure as shit she was hella pissed. Why the hell would I want to buy a new phone? I already have one! She started screaming at the top of her lungs. Her claims being of me upselling her and being a corporate goon, I finally managed to defuse the situation, and as she left the department, she gave me the classic, you'll never get a job in this town again. As I'm getting ready to leave my shift, my manager stops me and tells me I just got a complaint at customer service from a lady claiming I swore at her granddaughter. Apparently, I told her to fuck off. I explained what really happened, of course, and my manager just laughed it off. He knew it was very unlike me to ever say anything like that to a customer. I wish the story ended there, but then of course I wouldn't be writing this. For the next several weeks I would get complaints about things I'd never done, sometimes even on my days off. I would come in to questions from my management nearly every day. It was all complaints ranging from me being rude to a customer, all the way to me doing drugs in the parking lot on break. All of these complaints were of course coming from two women. As it turned out, it was cell phone lady and her adult daughter. It turns out they had even been scoping out my work schedule and started coming in nearly every day. They would walk through electronics to make sure they saw me and I was there. And then later that very same night, I would have a new complaint. This happened for months. It happened so much, management deemed her my favorite customer. To be honest though, I didn't care much. Actually, I even thought it was pretty funny and a bit pathetic. I never got in trouble and everyone knew these ladies and just blew it off. I started caring though when she took it to a whole new level. She started to follow me around. I would see her when I was around town. She started to make it clear she knew where I lived and would regularly start to walk by my house. I would see her standing out front, just staring into my place. I began getting complaints to the city about my property. Grass too tall, old shed in my yard, my fire pit, basically everything. She even found out my girlfriend's name and began complaining at her job too. I knew it was her. She would make it so clear and obvious she was following me. Sometimes she would stop in and ask me questions at work and act like the nicest customer. Then she'd drop hints like, how's your girlfriend? Or my favorite, how can you afford that big house on your little Walmart wage? For about seven months, she stalked and slandered me. 
I started telling her I knew what she was doing and to stop, but she played it off and I couldn't report her. After all, she'd never once threatened me. She was just making my life very hard. By this time, everyone in my life knew about this nut job. One night, I'm grabbing dinner with my friends from work and we're joking about it when someone offers a suggestion. Well, what if you just counter stalk her? At first, I thought it was a terrible idea, but they convinced me it would work and they would all help me. So we hatched a big plan like something you'd read on Pro Revenge. And it went as follows. Find her job, find her name, find her address, make complaints in the same manner as her. Find out all the rumors she's told about me, make it clear we know, and show her that unlike her, we have numbers. I found out her information easily enough. Turns out she didn't live anywhere near me. And it also turned out I was friends with a few of her co-workers. They would keep me informed on the crazy shit she said about me and even try to rein her in. And we began doing exactly what she was doing to me. We did this for about four months. The more we dug into her life, the more I found out about just how obsessed she was over getting me in trouble. She'd made reports I assaulted her. She encouraged others to falsely report me and follow me too. She told police I was a potential drug dealer. In the end, we won though. She started putting together that there were six of us digging deep into her life and asking many questions about her. My last month at work, I didn't get a single complaint. In fact, I never saw her anymore. The day after I quit though, I heard she started in the store complaining about a new person after asking one of the managers why I quit. I honestly will never understand why she was so hell-bent on trying to destroy me. I just told her to buy a $20 prepaid phone. For some background, I live in the UK and go to school with a uniform. I go to quite a large all-girls school with about 8 classes of 30 or so per year, with 5 years and a 6th form attached, so I've heard about creeps lingering outside of the school before. Usually though, they're sorted out quite quickly by the school staff. At the time, I was in year 9, so just turning 13 and about 4 foot 9. I had a big homework assignment due at the time, and because I didn't have a computer at home, I often stayed late at school to do it in the ICT suite. As it was the beginning of the school year, it got relatively dark at around 5pm, which is right around when I got out of school, and right around the time this event took place. I had to catch the bus to get home as both of my parents would work. The bus stop outside my school was fairly busy, and there were a couple of other people and me at the time. I had my back up against a fence, when I noticed a man under the bus stop, facing away but next to the road, opposite the fence I was leaning on. I was very aware of my surroundings, as I have had previous experiences with old creeps and I'm just a generally paranoid person anyway. The man didn't strike me as particularly interesting, but I did notice him glancing over at me from the very corner of my eye. I then saw a bus coming and assumed that it was mine so I stepped forward to check. Turned out it wasn't my bus, which was annoying, as I was very cold and didn't have a coat with me at the time. As I went to step back up against the fence, I almost stood right back into the man that had been under the bus stop originally. He had moved to directly behind where I was. He had his arm up against the pole next to the bus stop telling you the buses that come by. I felt a bit concerned but I couldn't move as on the other side all the people were waiting to get on the bus that was now coming. It felt like forever as I could feel this man's breath on the top of my head. I watched the bus come and collect all of the other people at the bus stop. It probably only took a minute and a half. Once the very last person got on that bus, I quickly moved out of this man's area and back against the fence. He moved so he was back under the bus stop sitting across from me and staring at the ground in front of me. At last, my bus came after about three minutes in that state. I didn't want to give away the fact that I was getting on this bus immediately, but I had to wave it down, so I stood next to the road to signal it over. 
As I started to get on, my heart was going crazy as the man had somehow snuck back behind me. I had already gotten my bus card out and scanned it very quickly and only saw a few people on there. Normally, there might be a few people upstairs on the bus in this case, so that's where I headed. That was probably my biggest success of the incident. Or mistake, I, I don't really know to be honest. I got up there and it was completely empty. Great. Well, I couldn't exactly go back down at this point. I knew the man had already gotten on and would be coming up the stairs soon, so I did the next best thing I could think of. I sat in the outside seat directly in front of the bus's camera, which I kept looking directly at just in case something happened. The man did follow me upstairs as expected. He sat right at the back of the bus, but not before looking at me as he passed by. It was then that I got the idea that probably saved me that night. I live on a very quiet street and it was already very dark now, so there was no way I was getting off this bus at my stop with this man. I pulled out my phone and earbuds. I put one bud in my ear and texted my best friend to play along. I FaceTimed her and quietly informed her of the situation. She understood everything. And along with some small talk, I talked loudly and at length about how my mom was so mad I'd stayed late at school, and she had just texted me saying she was waiting at the door for me. I had told her I was only 10 minutes away. In reality though, I had told my mom earlier that day that I was staying late in the morning before I left for school, and now my mom was long gone at work, at least 45 minutes away. My dad was gone even farther, about an hour and a half, and neither had access to their phones at work. Now we arrived at my stop and I had to get off. I took a deep breath as I stood up. I looked back at the man. He was staring at me as I walked down the stairs. My friend was screen recording everything at this point just in case something happened to me. Thankfully, he didn't follow me down at first, but as I was walking away from the bus, I looked back to see him pressed up against the back window, hands and fists and staring at me once more. That's when I took my flimsy school shoes off and sprinted to my house, as the next bus stop was still in eyesight. There were two on the main road that led down to my street. Once I was down my street and far enough away that you couldn't see the top of it anymore, I told my friend about him up against the window. She understood. I put my shoes back on and speed walked the rest of the way to my house. My family still doesn't know about this, even though I was quite proud of myself on how I handled the situation and how I ran so far with no shoes on, a heavy skirt and a big rucksack on my back. I don't think they'll ever know because as much as I don't want to ever stay late at school ever again, I know I probably will have to again at some point and I don't want my parents to feel guilty about not being able to help it if something more serious was to happen while they were at work. I'll note that I did tell the friend on the story and the rest of the people that I knew. I asked my sister because I knew she would understand and she said I should tell my parents. I think I will eventually. I've been in two bad car accidents. I know the rush of adrenaline going through your head when you're in a crash. For that reason, I always pull over at any crash I see to at least try and help out, unless I know emergency services are there already. I have a level head, basic medical training, and usually have a first aid kit on me as well. Normally everything is fine, and I leave once the EMS and police show up. Today, that changed. I came around the bend while driving and saw a pickup truck had slammed into a tree. A body was slumped over in the seat. I immediately pulled my bike into the subdivision right across the street and ran over, shirking off my bag, jacket, and helmet. I see a white man, maybe 20s, slim frame, slumped over in the seat convulsing with saliva dripping down the side of his face my brain instantly went to he's having a seizure. The car who was a bit behind me had also pulled over, and the driver was on the phone with 911 right next to me. He tapped on the window a bit, and there was no response. We checked if any of the doors were unlocked, and I jumped into the bed to see if the back window was either. None of them were. 
I hopped out and went to see if anything had changed. The driver was now no longer convulsing, but he was still unresponsive. I tried knocking on the window once more to see if he had come out of it yet. The driver jumped up and began panicking. Pretty common for someone who's just had a seizure, especially if they had a traumatic experience on top of it. He began to yell and lightly punch the window. This all happened in the span of about a second, which meant I jumped nearly 20 feet in the air in surprise. Once my brain cleared for a second though, I loudly asked if he was alright and if he would be able to unlock the door. Luckily for me, he didn't understand a word I said. He slumped back over, which prompted me to knock in concern once again. He jumped back up and began immediately freaking out. After a moment, he calmed down and sat there, smiling. It wasn't a normal smile, though. It was sort of haunting. His tongue was hanging out and it was extremely yellowed. The man who'd pulled over with me, Mark, came around, which brought another round of freaking out. This began the pattern of any new stimuli at all causing him to lash out. A third person pulled over and came to check in as well. He quickly came to the same conclusion. Drugs, I guess. Our driver was now in a relaxed state once more, until the sirens started. Me and the third person, whose name I never caught unfortunately, began directing traffic while Mark kept an eye on the driver, relaying everything to 911. I had moved my jacket, helmet, and bag over to near my bike, just in case he decided to start driving again or something. Finally, about a minute after we first heard the sirens, a fire truck, ambulance, and the sheriff all pulled up. The fire truck blocked traffic from one end. After briefly talking to the cop, Mark went to start turning cars around in the other direction. A cop pulled up from the end, blocked by the fire truck. The two cops, determining that the driver was in a combative state, drew their tasers. A firefighter used a pick to break open the driver's side rear window. After the first hit, the driver began to claw at the back window. Once it had been pulled out, the cops began yelling at him to open the door. Par for the course, the driver didn't understand a word. They decided to smash the front window as well. After the first hit, they didn't have to do much because the driver immediately began hitting back. He punched out the window entirely as the cops yelled some more. The driver was yelling, punching at everything, so the first cop tased him. If we hadn't heard the crackling, we'd not have even known it had worked. He was still swinging away. The second cop tased him. Still nothing. First cop again, second cop again. As the first cop tased him again with the marking of a fifth tasing, the second cop opened the door. The driver began kicking, punching, and scratching while getting dragged out of the car. The cops attempted to hold him down, but apparently drugs are a hell of a drug. The largest of the firefighters had to join in as well, just to be able to hold him down. Around this time, six more cop cars flew up, and they all ran over to assist. After here, though, it gets a bit boring. Mark and I had to stick around to be interviewed by the highway patrol officer, who would be investigating the wreck. I guess it just goes to show that driving under the influence is not a very good idea.